In our previous video, we looked at an overview of Hibernate. In this video, we're going to look at how to integrate Hibernate with our application. I have several little snippets that I've pasted into this Word document that I'm going to use in this video. And those will be available on GitHub as I will do a commit and push as soon as this video is over. So we need these prerequisites in this file. Uh, that is our POM dependency we're going to need to add. Uh, Maven's going to make it very easy for us. You see we have both a Hibernate dependency and in our case we have a MySQL driver uh, dependency. The nice thing about Hibernate is it works with quite a few databases. So it's not DB2 specific, MySQL specific, anything like that. So we have to pick which we want, the dependency for Hibernate and for the driver. After that, we're going to have our hibernate.cfg.xml file, which uh, is just specifying certain things about our Hibernate instance, our Hibernate util bootstrap class, and then some individual mapping files for our, uh, for our DTOs that we're mapping. So we need this. We also need to make sure that we have a project that's up and running in our virtual machine or wherever it's running. And we want to make sure that we have uh, uh, WAMP started and running as well. So typically what we'll do to check WAMP is we will click down here on the little up arrow and it should come up with a, a little WAMP icon. I don't see one now so I'm going to click on my start menu. We don't need this to start with Hibernate but we do want to make sure that our database is running. I'm going to go to all programs, type in WAMP, and then choose start WAMP server 64. Yes. Now you see at the bottom of the screen we have a little green W. That's generally good news. Uh, WAMP server online. Uh, and you see here again, uh, when you click on the little, I don't know what they call this little up arrow here, you see the W is green. Uh, that's good because it means that WAMP has started. It also means that Apache has been installed as a service. Uh, so if that is orange, you, you want to take a look at a previous video I made where I talked about installing Apache as a service. The next thing that we'll do then is we will take a look at phpMyAdmin and just make sure that that's up and running as well. So you can put in localhost in the, in the browser bar to see that, but honestly, I find sometimes if you have localhost without HTTP, it thinks you want to search on that. So easiest way is just a little HTTP colon slash slash 127.0.0.1 and then PHP my admin. And again, this is assuming that you have there we go. This is assuming that you set it up according to the instructions instructions in the previous video. Everything looks good. We have our plant places database. We have a plants table with a few items that we populated in an earlier video. So we'll, it looks like we're in good shape. Okay, so let's get started. First of all, uh, let's grab these dependencies. I'm going to highlight and copy. Uh, go to plant places. Go to POM XML, and then source. So if you're looking for these on uh, GitHub, this will be in the POM XML. I'm just going to go down to the dependency section and put this towards the bottom. There we go. Very nice. Makes things very easy on us. Just put the dependency and then it's able to go out and find them. Okay. The next thing that we want is uh, hibernate.cfg.xml. So I'm going to copy the text of this file here, and let's remember where we want to put it. Go back to our presentation here. Uh, Hibernate CFG XML goes straight in the source folder. So copy this text, and then I'll explain it in just a moment. Control M, and I'm going to go to Plant Places. I'm going to go to Java Resources, and then Source. Right click, and say New. And then we'll just say, uh, honestly, file is fine. I can choose other and just a general file because we're pasting uh, some text in here. Okay, so file name, hibernate.cfg.xml, and finally finish. Now I have pre-configured some things in here to make the video go a little bit faster. Uh, let's take a look because maybe you want to tweak these a little bit for your use. Uh, first of all, I have, <coughs> I have um, 
the JDBC driver that we're using for MySQL. Naturally, if you were using DB2, it would be a DB2 driver, SQL Server for Microsoft would be a SQL Server driver. So this driver class is going to be specific to the database that you're using. Now, I've chosen in this case to use the username root. Uh, that's highly not recommended, by the way, uh, but this will just test things out. We can come back later and change this to a different user, uh, but for the moment, this will at least uh, let us test things out. Even riskier, I'm using root without a password, so I've commented out the password property. As I say, later on, we'll make an actual username with a password. We'll also assign a password to root. Uh, to kind of close a little security hole there. But at this point, this is all on a self-contained virtual machine that only I have access to, so we can play around a little bit. Okay, next part is the JDBC connection URL. So this is the syntax that we need for MySQL. We start the URL with JDBC and then a colon, and then we have the database vendor that we're using, which in this case is MySQL. That's a fairly common syntax for a JDBC URL. Start with JDBC and then the vendor. So if it were DB2, it would be JDBC colon DB2. Uh, now, JDBC URL is simply a way that we can tell Java where our database is, how to access it. And it is a fairly common syntax like this, JDBC MySQL, and then an IP address, a port, and then a schema name. That's generally how JDBC URLs look, but there are some differences from vendor to vendor. Uh, for example, SQL Server uses a slightly different URL, and the ports are not standard across vendor vendors. For MySQL, the default port is 3306. Uh, for SQL Server, a lot of times, uh, going from memory, I think it's 1433. For DB2, many times it's 50,000. So the port, and that could change naturally. These are just the defaults. So JDBC, MySQL, IP address, the port, and then the schema name that we're using. Note that I'm using the local database 127.0.0.1. What would be a better idea is to make a host's entry for this IP address and then give it a vanity name or a nickname. That way, if our database ever changes, which is likely we move it to a different machine, all we have to do is change the entry in our hosts file. Uh, so hosts is a file where we can associate vanity names with IP addresses. And that's especially a good idea here because if our database location were to change to a different machine, uh, if I have it hard coded in this file, that means I have to go in, change this file, potentially rebuild and redeploy. That's a whole lot of work. Where if I have a vanity name for it, all I have to do is change the host entry and at worst case, restart the web application. It's a lot simpler that way. So let's think about that. We'll remember that for, for later. Finally, what is this plant places? Well, that's why I pulled up uh, PHP, my admin earlier. That's this uh, database that we created and the database contains tables like the one called plant. Okay. So that's this name here. If we chose something else naturally, if we just called it maybe plants, or if we called it maybe uh, foo, then this would be foo right here. Okay. What Hibernate dialect? We want to tell it we're speaking MySQL. An interesting thing about, uh, about databases is that there is something called ANSI, the American National Standards Institute, and it has SQL 92 compliance, which means a SQL database must do these things, and it defines a list of things that it must do and the syntax that it must use to do those. So a select statement, a very general select statement will run the same in any ANSI 92 SQL compliant database. The trick is it doesn't specify everything. So there are some things that database vendors tend to do differently, uh, and the prime example is how they generate sequence numbers for a unique ID. So for these things that fall outside of those ANSI standards, we have to understand, okay, what's permitted? And that's what this dialect is telling us. One thing you'll see a lot in SQL Server databases is that many times the tables and the columns will have spaces in them. So you might have something like common space name. Other databases don't tend to do that. So uh, they'll have common underscore name. So that's one of those differences that you might see from one vendor to another. 
After we have all that, we have our mapping resources. The mapping resource says, okay, this is where you can find all of the Java classes that are mapped to all of the database tables. And here I've put one in, uh, comprotocyteplant.hbm.xml. That's going to map our plant DTO to the plant table. Okay. Uh, now note, where do we start this? Where is comprotocyte DTO? Well, remember that we've placed this hibernate.cfg.xml file in the source, the root source folder of our application. So com protocyte DTO uh, is relative to that location. And you know, I see a little mistake. Uh, well, not a mistake, but something we need to fix. Uh, and that is, I did a basically a dry run of this in my example project to get prepared for this lecture. Uh, that has a different package name. So instead of protocyte here, we're going to say com plant places slash DTO slash plant.hbm.xml. And that's going to take us down this path com.plantplaces.dto and then we need to make a file under here called plant.hbm.xml so let's take a look at that I go back to my scratch pad and I'm going to grab before I forget I'm gonna grab kind of a stub here we'll add more to it later uh, again I, I copied this in here to give us uh, make the video go a little bit faster because things like you don't want to watch me type this line so uh, there's a little stub here that we can expand on Highlight Control C. Okay, go to my DTO package. Right click New. And once again, we're going to say Other File. And it brings up a little Select a Wizard. We just need a, a general file. So, I mean, it doesn't really matter. Uh, so, General. And then just File. That's fine. Okay, and then we're going to call this plant.hbm.xml. And we're going to choose Finish. I will go ahead and paste my stub in here and tidy it up a little bit. And then we're going to save. More to come on this in just a moment. But for now, we do have one more thing we need to consider, which is this Hibernate Util class. Don't forget this class. We only need this one time. Uh, but this is a class that we're going to need that just kind of tells us, hey, I'm using Hibernate, and here's how to use Hibernate. So we only need that one time, and we want to figure out where we want to put it. We want to put it in the DAO folder. So I select Hibernate Util. I select the whole class, Control-C, and this is a Java class, so it's not just a file. I'm going to go to that DAO folder, right-click, choose New, and then Class, and naturally call it Hibernate Util and finish and we're going to paste most of it anyway okay uh, we'll leave the package as it is and then control v okay and save probably a good idea because i just put in a source class here probably a good idea to do a build at this point but for now let's go back to our plant.hbm.xml file and let's finish that one up whoops just a moment Okay, so we see here we have the normal XML overhead. Then we have our root element, which is hibernate mapping. Within that, we have an element called class. And take a look at what we have here. Name, com protocyte DTO plant. Well, that's not right. Uh, it's close, but I mentioned that I kind of did a little pre-work for us here, and I, I don't have the correct package. So let's control shift R in Eclipse, and let's look for plant. And let's look for the one in the plant places package. And here it is. Now let me show you a little trick with Eclipse. What I need is the fully qualified class name. That means the package name and the class name. Now don't try to type it out from memory because you'll likely misspell or add a space or miscapitalize. We don't want to do that. So a lot of times you're tempted to copy this and then paste it and then copy the class name and then paste it. I'll show you an easier way. Go to edit. Copy qualified name. And when you do that, make sure you have your cursor on the class name itself. Edit copy qualified name. Let's go back to plant HBM XML now and let's fix our issue. Watch this. I'm going to highlight and remove the incorrect entry. And then I'm going to control V. Did you see what that pasted? 
copy qualified name means put your cursor on any type and then choose edit copy qualified name and it will copy into the clipboard the qualified name which is the package name and the class name itself. It's really handy in an operation like this where you need that whole name and maybe you don't even know what it is. Maybe you're in a big class and you know you don't know what it is. Okay, table plants, catalog plant places. Let's see the equivalent of that in PHP MyAdmin. The table is plants. This is the table that we created uh, last in a previous video. And the catalog plant places, that is our database. So those are the two entries that we need up here in this class name element. Okay, ID name GUID, type equals Java Lang integer. Let's make sure that I'm using the correct field here. So we have a GUID, global unique identifier. In this case, because we're writing the server side, we're essentially writing the uh, central knowledge repository for this plant places application which means that we are defining the global unique identifier. So global unique identifier as an int, when we look at plant HBM XML, global unique identifier, and then Java Lang integer. That's what we call the uh, supporting class, the capital I integer, uh, used in auto boxing, auto unboxing. In other words, Java can easily convert from the primitive type int to the class type integer with a capital I. So that's good. Column name plant ID generator class identity. If we look again at MySQL, let's make sure that I have that right. Plant ID is our unique, uh, our unique key, our primary key. If we take a look at the table that we created, plant ID, auto increment, uh, cannot be null. Okay, and this is our primary key. Okay, then the others we have genus, species, cultivar, and common. And those are ones that we're going to want to map. Uh, so the genus, species, cultivar, and common, those are not unique keys. We have multiple species of the same genus. So for this, I have property name genus, type equals string, lowercase s, uh, because uh, genus is a string. Column genus, length 255, not null, false, unique, false. So we're saying, okay, uh, we can have multiple genus or genera uh, said properly. And we're not worried about nullability. It's okay to have a null genus. I'm a little uncomfortable with that last one. It's okay to have a null common name, cultivar, or species. Genus we should always have. But we saw in a previous video how we did some application level checking on that to make sure that we're only saving plants with a legitimate genus. So we'll let that go. Okay. From here, what we can do is we can duplicate these entries and we can make them look like our DTO. So I'll tell you what, we will take care of that in our next video when we actually create a Hibernate stub, uh, or a Hibernate DAO rather, and at that point we'll be able to watch this persist. So we'll pick up there. I look forward to seeing you then.